mystery of the lost expedition. Astrahan, the year is 1713. A Mangishlak merchant arrives in the city. He declares to the Astrahan grandee that he desires an audience with Emperor Peter the Great no less. He supposedly has information that no ruler can resist. His Excellency is surprised, but he listens to what the merchant has to say. He then decides to personally accompany the merchant to St. Petersburg for a meeting with the Tsar. A number of fateful decrees of Peter the Great resulted from this incredible encounter, as well as numerous expeditions, thousands of lives lost, and the founding of several cities. So what exactly did this merchant tell the Emperor? Why would one turn back the rivers? A villainous Khan from Bukhara or someone similar blocked the river and now the gold is flowing in the opposite direction. Where did one seek the route to the treasures of India? Its main goal was the reconnaissance of the route. And how did the Caspian Sea help the Russian Emperor to become a member of a Parisian academy? Peter I called the Kazakh steppe the gateway to Asia. Tragic coincidences and deadly geography. The Indian project of Peter the Great and the unattainable gold of Mangistau. A bloody path to countless treasures. The Great Steppe. The mystery of the lost expedition. Chapter 1. The Gold of Mangistau. Peterhof. The year is 1714. The construction of the Emperor's country residence is in full swing and the stronghold has already been built. Peter even determined how the main fountains would look. In reality, Peter the Great had a slightly different idea, but this monument was erected ten years after his death, during the reign of Anna Ionovna. And since the Battle of Poltava, which ended in a Russian victory, took place on the day of St. Samson, Russia is depicted as Samson, and the lion represents Sweden, because the lion is part of the coat of arms of this country. But although the Swedes were beaten at Poltava, the northern war continued, and there was a catastrophic lack of gold in the country. The Tsar received information that somewhere in Central Asia there were gold deposits, gold-bearing rivers. And at this time, that same Mangishlak merchant, with a message for the Emperor in person. Through his acquaintance, Prince Bekovic Cherkaski, the Astrakhan grandee organized a meeting with the king. It was an absolutely audacious story. He was told that gold could be found on the Sir Darya or the Amu Darya rivers, and that there were bars of gold right in the river, and that these ingots were there for the taking, and that the villainous Khan of Bukhara, or someone similar, had blocked the river, and now the gold flowed in the opposite direction, and it could flow to the Russians. This gold-bearing river now flows into the Aral Sea, the merchant said, and the dam was built somewhere near Bukhara, that is, in Bukharia. Peter the Great became extremely interested in this information. In general, he was always drawn to the east. Peter I called the Kazakh steppes the gateway to Asia. For the first time during the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the Russians began to send military expeditions to this territory. By an amazing coincidence, a message came at the same time from the Siberian governor Gagarin that in Malaya Bukharia, as Xinjiang was called back then, there was a secret city named Irket, where immeasurable gold could be found. This city was likely Yarkand, which belonged to the Zhungars at that time. The Kiva ambassador then confirmed that gold was said to be found in the Amudarya and asked Peter I to build a fortress on the Caspian Sea in order to defend it from the Zhungar Khan. Bukharia and Bukhara, apparently, seemed to the emperor to be one and the same. However, the Ustyurt Plateau was at that time called the Irketsky Mountains, named after the city of Irket. 
Peter at one time looked at these territories rather one-sidedly. He had something of a narrow perspective. And then Peter ordered that the hidden city be found and that the gold-bearing river be turned back, or, more precisely, restored to its original course. Either way, Peter gave instructions that this place be found and that the river be divided so that it would flow correctly. That is to say, quite an audacious, fantastical scheme. However, as it later transpired, these fantasies contained a number of grains of truth. So it was that in May 1714, the expedition of Lieutenant Colonel Butchols set out to look for the sandy gold on the Irtish. And in June, the Kabardian prince, Alexander Bekovich Cherkaski, who was fluent in the Turkic dialects and whose real name was Devlet Girey Murza, set off in the direction of the Caspian Sea. By that time, however, the government had already changed in Kiva. A new Khan was on the throne, and it seems that there was no longer anyone to build a fortress against. The expedition was equipped, nevertheless. You are sent to Kiva with compliments to the Khanate, and from there on to Bukhara, there to found some trade. But the real business is to learn of the city of Irket, how far it is from the Caspian Sea, and if there are any rivers that flow from there. Peter the Great. Alexander Pushkin intended to write a novel about the prince's incredible adventures and his tragic fate, but never found the time. But it was repeatedly mentioned in an unfinished work dedicated to Peter the Great. This may be because the circumstances surrounding the life of Pushkin's ancestor are in many ways similar to those of Bekovich Cherkaski. This was also an interesting figure. He was one of the associates of Peter the Great. He was not merely an associate. He was a descendant of a noble family, kidnapped in childhood, the godson of Peter the Great. He was also sent to study in Europe, and before that he was brought up in the noble family of Golitsyn, the sovereign's mentor. And with the assistance of the emperor again, Cherkaski married Golitsyn's daughter. Embarking upon a routine campaign, the prince still had no inkling of the tragic events that awaited both him and his family. How did the first expeditions end? Where did the prince go? And did he find the gold? Chapter 2 – Secret Missions Prince Cherkaski has been sent to Astrakhan and to the Caspian Sea for some necessary business which he himself will reveal. Give him 1,500 soldiers and 5,000 rubles to fulfill without delay all the requirements of this prince, Peter I. In addition, the order was given that mining experts accompany them so that they could understand the business of gold. The officials were ordered not to stand in Cherkaski's way and to take with them about one and a half thousand Yaik Cossacks. They started out in a training camp in Astrakhan, but the winter of 1714 set in early, and the prince did not even manage to reach Guriev, present-day Atirao. A powerful storm broke out, and some of the ships were simply wrecked in the sea or run aground, and so he returned to Astrakhan. In the spring of the following year, he hit the road again. The fleet entered the Caspian Sea. The objectives of the journey were primarily to explore. For both Russia and Europe at that time, the Caspian was not a well-known sea, and the maps were very approximate, to put it mildly. Before Peter, the Caspian was marked on the maps according to information collected in Africa over 1500 years previously, namely according to Ptolemy of Alexandria, Karl Bayer, one of the founders of the Russian Geographical Society. Therefore, it is impossible to overestimate the impact of Prince Cherkaski's expeditions. He was the first of the European explorers to sail along the entire eastern coast of the Caspian. 
Today it is mainly the territory of Mangistau. He prepared a map of the routes that he had covered, which was a map of the Central Asian regions. During this research, he actually discovered an old dry riverbed, which is believed to have been a tributary of the Amudarya. I got to the place where the Amudarya River flowed into the Caspian Sea. Four days' drive from Kiva, water no longer flows there because the river has been blocked by a dam. From that dam, the river is forced to flow into the lake, which is called the RLC. Alexander Bekovich Cherkaski. At some point in time, the Amudarya had disappeared due to a number of specific factors, including anthropogenic ones. Among the anthropogenic factors, Cherkaski also highlights the dam, which he did not see for himself, however. By October of that same year, the prince sent a report to the emperor. Supposedly, gold bars were included alongside the report. It's unclear, though, where Bekovich had sourced them. Whether it is true or not, Peter I ordered the prince to come to see him in person. In February 1716, Cherkaski presented to the emperor a map of the Caspian Sea, received a new title of captain of the guard from the Tsar, and immediately went back with new orders containing 13 action points. One of those action points was to reach the RLC and find the dam. The territory was too vast for them to visit all at once, given the difficulty of moving around back then. Some of the orders were fulfilled. For example, the prince established three fortresses, which the following three cities later sprang from, Turkmenbashi and Kazakhstan's Fort Shevchenko. The last one to have been established was Alexander Bai at Cape Tiup Karagan, on the coast of the bay that Bekovich gave his name to. Peter's decree also included quite a grand ambition, which the emperor had long been interested in, to seek the treasures of India. Where is the route to India? What secret assignments were given to Bekovich? And how did the prince's family die? Chapter 3 – An Indian Mirage Money is to be provided for long-distance journeys along the rivers, along the Sir Darya for gold exploration, and then along the Amu Darya to India, under the guise of a merchant. Money is also necessary for this outward and return journey, and the matter is to be managed at the behest of His Imperial Majesty. Alexander Bekovich Cherkaski Unpredictable, aromatic, mystical, wealthy and fabulous, India has always attracted conquerors, merchants and adventurers. Peter the Great had an adventurous spirit, as did the chicks in his nest, as his entourage were referred to. The famous India syndrome has existed from the Middle Ages to the beginning of the 20th century. India and its riches and mysteries captivated every monarch in Europe. There was even a saying that there was no wealth and glory without India. Even Peter's father, Alexis of Russia, had tried to pave the way by equipping expeditions to India and Peter himself had already sent an envoy to the great Mughal of India. All these excursions were fruitless. This is largely due to the trade interests of the empire, and when Peter the Great sends Cherkaski to Kiva on an expedition, the strategic goal is to find a route to India. At that time, it was widely believed the route to India could be found along the Amu Darya. Thus, the task for Bekovich seemed straightforward. He had to find the old riverbed, destroy the dam built by the malevolent Khan, and at the same time learn of the spices, gemstones and exotic beasts of India. Furthermore, en route, he was to search for gold on the Sir Darya by gaining access to the hidden city of Irket. 
forging alliances with all the local rulers would also be beneficial. Cherkasky's expedition was a multifaceted one in terms of its activities. The prince was expected to dispatch a commercial caravan to India. However, the main goal of the expedition was to explore the route itself. Cherkasky sent Mirza Kutlu Mohammed Tefkilev, disguised as a merchant, to explore the route to India via Persia. Tevkilev was a reliable man, a Muslim, and a personal translator of Peter the Great. A delegation was sent headed by Tevkilev, an interpreter. As a man of the Orient, a Tatar in the Russian service, he spoke several languages and was under orders to investigate matters thoroughly. At the same time, the Russian emperor ordered the Kiva ambassador in St. Petersburg to go to India and return with exotic birds and animals. Yet, once again, none of these campaigns were successful. India seemed to be a cursed business. A storm brought Tevkilev to the Persian city of Istarabad where he was imprisoned and, following the death of Bekovich and by the diligence of our ambassador to Persia, was later released before returning to Astrakhan, his plans having failed. Alexander Pushkin. Meanwhile, Bekovich Cherkasky, himself from Guriev, modern-day Atyrau, went to look for the dam and to negotiate with the Khan of Kiva. Bekovich. In 1716, Bekovich Cherkasky went to Kiva through the lands of Mangistau, but his campaign ended in failure. The failure of his expedition is due to the fact that it was doomed from the outset. And the failure was preceded by tragedy. It was said that they loved each other deeply. She even named her two sons after the prince. Alexander Jr. and Alexander Sr. Together with their four children, Martha Cherkaskia saw her husband off. They parted in Astrakhan. The family went home. The prince went to Kiva, via Guriev. At that time, Bekovich received the news that his wife had drowned with her two children in the Volga. He became discouraged and distraught. Alexander Pushkin. His son was saved by a miracle. The baby was thrown ashore and picked up by fishermen. The prince did not speak for several days and refused to eat. But he was a man of duty and honor. The sovereign's assignment still had to be fulfilled. In the summer of 1717, the detachment trekked along the old caravan route to meet its fate, the Ustuart Plateau in 50 degrees of heat. Several weeks of travel were required from one source of water to another. Traces of caravans, the places where the caravanserai were located, have been preserved to this day in our Mangistau on the Ustjot Plateau. The climate here is distinctly continental. In the summer, ground temperatures can reach 70 degrees. Bekovich lost a quarter of his detachment in the scorching desert. The expedition had not prepared for such a crossing. There was a catastrophic shortage of water, equipment, food, and a sheer lack of experience. The travelers also had to fight off raids from local bandits, and none of them knew that the worst part of the story still lay ahead of them. Why did the fate of the prince become a proverb? How was Peter the Great elected as an academician of France? And how did the audacious campaign end? Epilogue The Death March Lost like Bekovich. The general meaning is a great misfortune that befell someone. From the dictionary of Vladimir Dal. This is the story of how the tragic fate of the prince became a proverb. The arduous desert crossing was now behind them. Bekovich's detachment was approaching Kiva. They seemed so close to the legendary dam, which supposedly blocked the path of gold. Prince Cherkasky sent a message to the Khan that the expedition was peaceful. If truth be told, it did not appear to be the case. 
I think Bekovic made a huge mistake in amassing a huge army while carrying out the imperial decree. There were two and a half thousand men armed with cannons. And then there was the intrigue of he who seemed to be an ally of Peter the Great, the Kalmyk Khan. The Khan asked Bekovic for military assistance, but the prince, whose relatives the Kabardians had fought with the Kalmyks, refused, saying that he did not have the emperor's authorization. The Kalmyk guides then fled from Bekovic and informed the Kievan ruler that the prince himself wanted to take his throne. Kiva perceived this as a military threat, although Bekovic had no strategic military goals. He was surrounded by 24,000 soldiers under the command of the Khan of Kiva. Their unsuccessful attacks continued for three days. Bekovic withstood it all. Alexander Pushkin. The Khan then decided to act with cunning. He agreed to peace negotiations, swore on the Quran that he would not harm anyone, but did not let the soldiers into the city on the pretext that he would not be able to feed them all. He advised the detachment to camp in five local villages, and then, at nightfall, everyone was cut down. Bekovic himself was hacked to death, his skin was flayed, and his body was stuffed like an animal. Cherkaski's expedition was defeated. The Kiva Khan sent the head of the unfortunate Bekovic to the Bukhara Khan, boasting that he had delivered himself and his neighbor from a dangerous enemy. The Bukhara Khan expressed his indignation and called him a cannibal, which pleased Peter, who decided to use the Bukhara Khan to resume his enterprise. Alexander Pushkin. At around the same time that Bekovic was killed on the order of the Khan of Kiva, Peter the Great arrived for the first time in Paris, the city of his dreams. The Louvre was a royal residence. There are several assumptions about what the word Louvre means. Perhaps a watchtower or a fortress wall. And perhaps the most popular version is that it means the lair of the wolf. The French wanted to accommodate the Russian king here, but he refused and preferred more modest housing. He was interested in many things, but first and foremost, he agreed to an exchange of scientific knowledge with the Academy of Paris. This is the positive side of the emperor's activities. In this respect, he was an excellent researcher. Peter gave the French a map of the Caspian Sea, drawn by Bekovic Cherkaski. The French were overjoyed with the Tsar's gift and made the emperor a member of the academy. But this map was barely used within Russia itself. Following his death, envious people began to denigrate Bekovic by saying that he got nothing right. Many years later, the forgotten map was found, and it turned out to be a work of great diligence. The dam, of course, did not exist, but there really was gold in the Amu Darya and Sir Darya, just in another part of the rivers. After the Bekovic failure, Kazakhstan and the Kazakh steppe began to be spoken of as a gateway to the riches of the region. Wealth was seen in the broader sense of this word and wasn't limited only to gold. All this, of course, was observed with alarm in the Kazakh steppe. Peter I continued to nurture his ideas for an eastern campaign, including to India, and in mid-June 1722 he arrived in Astrakhan. The celebrated phrase is that when Peter spoke of the Kyrgyz Kazakh horde, he said that they were the key and the gateway to everything. This phrase is quoted by Tevkelev in his memoirs. Moreover, he says that Peter allegedly once said this whilst looking out from the coast of the Caspian Sea. Thoughts of gold-bearing rivers and other treasures never left Peter the Great. So, the imperial hunt for innumerable earthly riches continued, albeit without Bekovic. Legend has it that, on his deathbed, Peter regretted two things, that he did not avenge Turkey for the failure on the river Prut, and he did not avenge Kiva for the murder of Bekovic. Alexander Pushkin.